Log entry, the catch, Scarlet Queen. Position, 132 degrees, 6 minutes west, 25 degrees, 15 minutes north. Gyro compass course, 275. Wind fresh, sky fair. Remarks, departed island of Muninjima at 4.15 p.m. After unlogged movement of vessel. Reason for move, the Spaniard and the Lascar pirates. It was mid-afternoon, 15 days after we dropped the Hawaiian chain behind us that we raised on the horizon the mountain peaks of Muninjima and our appetite for cool, sweet water and fresh fruit. The island lies some 500 miles east-northeast from the Bonin Group and had served as a Japanese base during the war. My pre-war charts due to Jap secrecy were incomplete and inaccurate, but just before sunset when we stood around the southern tip, we did find the anchor had shown on them. It was a small half-moon bay protected by a line of breakers foaming in over a barrier reef. A little north of the center of the reef was our pass, wide enough for the queen to slip through with good steerage way, friendly currents, and a light hand at the wheel. The water over the side took on a shallow look as we approached under power, and Gallagher went to the bow with a hand lead to measure the depth. He heaved the lead in line forward, and his readings came rolling back. By the mark! By... Five fathoms, leaving a few to spare between keel and bottom. Water lead! By but shallowing to less than five as we closed on the pass. By the teeth! Four! Four and a half fathoms, and the teeth of the coral started to show through the white froth of surf. And the currents washing back from it took the bow of the queen from port and pushed. By the mark! Four! Easy, skipper, easy! I fought the wheel, and for a moment the scarlet figurehead seemed to rest on the reef. And then her head swung into the narrow channel. The shoulders of the reef swirled by us on each side. No bottom at 15. No bottom at 15. We were in the deep, quiet water. After our anchors were secured to the sandy bottom, Gallagher and I dropped into our dinghy and rowed toward a small pier that jutted out from the beach. At water level, we were able to see a cluster of half a dozen tin-roofed frame buildings set back from the shore and shaded by a grove of banyans and cocoa palms. We shipped our oars, started to make fast when we heard footsteps on the pier above us. I looked up, straight into the muzzle of a 30 caliber rifle. A single watery china blue eye looked at me from behind the sights. Go back to your ship. Wait a minute. My ears stuffed up, or did you say go back to our ship? Get your ship out of the bay. You are welcome here. We need stores. This is no social call. We need water and fresh fruit, or we wouldn't have stopped. He's drunk, Skipper. Here, let me take that pop gun away from him. Oh, wait a minute, Red. I think he means it. I think he's... Red! Red, are you hit? No. But you're right, Skipper. He does mean it. The guy's stark raving nuts. <laughs> And so Mutual continues The Voyage of the Scarlet Queen, written by Gil Dowd and Bob Tolman, and starring Elliot Lewis. The Scarlet Queen, proudest ship to sail the seas, bound for uncharted adventure. Every week, a complete entry in the log, and every week, a league further in the strange Voyage of the Scarlet Queen. I stood there in the dory, looking up at the rifle and the man behind it. He was a dissipated 35, dressed in rumpled white duck trousers, no shirt, and a linen jacket streaked down the front with liquor and food stains. I was trying to figure how drunk he was and whether to make a try for the rifle myself when a movement shoreside caught my eye. And what a movement. She walked across that strip of beach as if she owned it. Emmett! Emmett, what are you doing out here? I don't want them ashore. Give me that rifle. Give it here. There's too many of them here already. Give me that gun. I'll shoot them and then the others. You drunken fool. 
Go on. Go on or I'll use it on you. All right. We haven't got trouble enough. We'll have it now. I'm sorry, gentlemen. My husband has been ill. Please come ashore. You're more than welcome. <laughs> well, Skipper, what are we waiting for? That's a foolish question, Red. I'm Nora Fairfield. Welcome to Mooneen Zima. I'm sorry your first greeting was so unpleasant. Yeah. What does your husband hunt with that cannon? Men. He hates them. But uh, you don't, hmm? Certainly not. That's why he does. You said he was sick. What's wrong with him? Nothing you have to worry about. But I think I should warn you. You aren't the only visitors on Mooneen Jima. For an island that gets a steamer twice a year, we're doing well. I didn't see any boat in the bay. He wasn't as good a sailor as you are. He lost his ship on the reef a month ago. He should have stayed home. I'm beginning to think so myself. I let Red fight his own way out of that one. Something up ahead of us interested me more at the moment. She'd taken us into the compound, and we were maybe 50 yards from the resident's house. It was a typical island bungalow built up on stilts with a deep veranda across the front of it, but it wasn't the house that interested me. It was the group of bare-chested, brown-skinned East Indians squatting on their heels at the foot of the stairs. They looked as though their short leave had lasted too long. And the curved knives they wore looked even meaner than their faces. Their eyes followed us as we went past them and into the house. Two men were sprawled in wicker chairs, and neither of them was her husband. The dark one, built along the lines of Rocky Graziano, grinned up at it. Come in, hombres. The girls save you from the husband, too, no? Captain Ramirez, Captain, uh... Carney, Phil Carney. And Mr. Gallagher, my first officer. Uh, that's good enough. I'm Dr. Mitchell, Thomas Mitchell. And you needn't tell me I looked the path. I've been told before. Captain Ramirez is the man I told you about, Captain Carney. You men talk. I'll go see if my husband has enough bottles to keep him comfortable. Hmm. <clears throat> uh, that was tough, losing your ship, Ramirez. A uh, mal suerte. Sometimes bad, sometimes good. This time, bad. But who knows? Maybe things get better today. Better. Better, he says. With that heathen crew of yours squatting on the heels outside... Ready to sink those murderous knives into our backs if we so much as look cross-eyed at them? Don't talk so much. Or I'll let you die on this island. So, that's your plan. You think you'll buy your way out of here in the Scarlet Queen and leave me here to rot? As one Irishman to another, Mr. Carney, this pirate has not got the price of a passage. You will have to excuse this doctor. <laughs> Too much, son. But if you take me, Carney, I have money in the States. See, si, like the money you stole in Manaquari. He will be in jail before he pays. <laughs> Listen to the man. That boat under the reef. Where do you think Captain Ramirez came by such a vessel? He stole it. And if you don't look sharp, that is enough. Uh, now I help you out, doctor. You're a little rough on your passengers, aren't you, Ramirez? Yeah, <laughs> uh, him. He lived too long in the tropics. His brain is fried. Maybe I should have butted in and saved him a sore jaw. The Scarlet Queen isn't taking on any passengers here. No room. Hey, yeah. uh, how big is your crew, Connie? Eight seamen. <laughs> That's funny. That's my crew. Eight men. But our crew's carrying guns, Ramirez, in case you got any ideas. I didn't see anything but knives on those Laskas of yours. I don't worry. I've got gun down in my bungalow. But to see here, I prefer the knife myself. An eight-inch knife blade vibrated in the table in front of us. He was so fast I didn't even see where it came from, but there it was. He flashed us a smile full of oversized, overpolished teeth, then tugged the knife out of the wood and left. This is a great island, Skipper. I'm glad you brought me here. I just wish there was enough daylight and tide left to get us through that reef and out of here. You think he's crazy enough to try and take the Queen? I don't know, Red, but I'm not sleeping tonight. Neither are you. We'll keep our eye on him from two places. I'll row you back to the ship, and I'm staying ashore. Wait a minute, Skipper. You're pulling your rank on me. I met her, too. Forget it, Red. 
There's a husband and Ramirez in the picture, too. By the time I'd taken Gallagher to the Queen, broken out enough rifles to arm the crew and rowed back to the island, night had fallen. And the first quarter moon was rising above the tops of the palms. I stopped when I hit the beach to get my bearings, decide which way to go. The threat was real enough, I was sure of that. Island shipwreck has turned sweeter characters than Ramirez to piracy. And the only way he or any of us could get out of there was on the decks of the Scarlet Queen. He was facing a crew of natives filled with frenzy for a home thousands of miles away. I was two legs out on a voyage with a $10 million prize at its destination, somewhere in the South Pacific. I'd fought before and I was ready to fight again to keep the Scarlet Queen underway. I found a shadow, black in the faint moonlight, made my automatic handy at my waist, and started counting the minutes to the rise of sun and tide and the chance to get away from this place. The first 20 went by slowly and quietly. Then I heard a rustle in the brush behind me. I took a quick step sideways, snapped my automatic from my belt, and whirled to face the sound. Oh! Oh, Captain Carney, you... Oh, why waste time on an act? You didn't surprise me. Came looking for you. You just startled me a little. That puts us on common ground, except for the surprise. Why were you looking for me? Because I've got to get away from Emmett. I want to go with you. Talk sense. I can't take you with me. You could, Phil. I don't know what's going to happen if I stay here with that decaying pig. I'm afraid I'll kill him. And I'm afraid he'll kill me. I've got to get away from here. Phil, look at me. Please, Phil, take me away from here. You don't touch me, gorgeous. I can hear you saying the same thing the same way to Emmett about getting away from some other sucker. The only way you're going to get away from this island is on a tramp steamer. Uh -uh. Oh, Phil, I didn't mean that. Really, I didn't. I'm just going crazy, that's all. Phil, if you know what kind of a woman I am, can't we let it go at that? Then I couldn't hurt you. Phil. Phil... Just for a minute, don't be afraid of me. I, I hit you, didn't I? Because you knew me. For a second, I hated you. But now I don't. That's too bad. I feel more comfortable when you do. Anybody on any island would have given her A for effort and the same for her injured pride exit as she left my little plot of beach. I had half a hunch and maybe half a hope that she wasn't through pleading her case and she'd be back. I sat there through the next hour trying to keep my mind on the queen's cabin lights bobbing slightly out in the bay and to be ready for any movement towards her. There was only a split-second awareness of someone behind me, then a brown forearm was across my throat. I got a glimpse of a second figure slipping around in front of me. It was a turbaned Lascar. I kicked out at him. And the last thing I remembered was the smell of chloroform and the cloth he jammed across my nose and mouth. And the deep, gasping breath my lungs forced me to take when the forearm relaxed a little. That and the sound of oars being put in oarlocks. As somebody jumped into the dinghy and headed for the Scarlet Queen. And then the beach, the island, the whole world pulled away from me and I was too tired to care. first thing I coasted back on was the light that leaked in through my eyelids. Then the nausea. The throbbing in my head. I got my eyes open long enough to realize that the brightness was coming through a window. It was daylight. Broad daylight. That's when I tried to get up and fell back on the cot. Ah, Connie. Your iris right from the brink of consciousness. Welcome back to a world of beauty. Yeah. What I can remember of it, I'm sure I like it. Help me up, will you, Doc? I've already helped you up. If it hadn't been for me, you'd be well on your way to enriching the soil here on Moon and Jima. Hold it, Doc. Take me a while to collect these things. Here, an ammonia ampoule. If you must think, this will help clear it up. My ship, Doc? It's gone. But you're wrong. When you came into the bay out there, 
in the situation here, it was no longer your ship. It was common property among desperate people. You and I happened to lose. My mate Gallagher? Who knows? Even common property himself. Shared between three or four types of flesh-eating fish. My headache's stuck. I can't get very far beyond that yet. I'll mix you something. Huh. They brought you here last night after they plucked you off the beach. With my chloroform, by the way. Uh -huh. I was supposed to kill you neatly and silently. A slight swelling in your right arm was the point of injection. Uh -huh. Due to some last-minute loyalty to our common heritage, I lightened the doors. Thanks. Here, drink this. Yeah. You might say that you have been one milligram away from a heathen grave. <laughs> my <coughs> payment, of course was to be passage out of here with Ramirez. <laughs> you see, I'm here as a result of my dishonesty to him, no doubt. I feel sorry for you, Doc. Indeed, I feel the same thing myself. Now, if you'll get up on your own two feet instead of lying there like a sick dog, I think you'll feel better. Get a breath of air if you can find some moving. I was halfway to my feet before his last words got through the dizziness. There wasn't any air moving. I stumbled to the door and looked out. Palms and banyans were motionless. That meant one thing to me. The Scarlet Queen had to be under power to make any way. There wasn't enough breeze to even rattle her halyards. My wristwatch read 9 a.m., an hour and 10 minutes after the earliest tide she could have crossed the reef on. I knew that if I could get high enough, my ship would still be in sight. I didn't know why I should torture myself. Maybe it was like hiding in a corner to watch your girl marry another guy. But I pulled what was left of me together and started up the mountain to see where the queen was going with somebody else. The summit was a jumble of rock. I scraped my way to the very top and stood there. Twelve miles of rolling, folded hills and valleys stretched to the north. Three miles of gentle slope to the south. And beyond, in a great circle, empty sea horizon, not a sail, not a mast, not a speck in sight. Then I went down the mountain and back to the compound. It wasn't until then that I felt the new atmosphere of the place. Yesterday had been filled with chattering birds. Now there was nothing but the muttering of the surf against the reef, a leaden sky and humid, oppressive air. I went to the residence house to find Nora, hoping she'd know where Ramirez would make for. I found her room and knocked. There wasn't any answer. I knocked again, and then I went in. Ah. <laughs> like I say, Connie, mal suerte. But uh, you look surprised to find me waiting for you. After the build-up, what else? What is the build-up when it all falls down? Where's my ship? I wish I knew. I wish I knew so well I was on it. How did you miss after your boys smothered me on the beach? Uh, I make big mistake. I warn you, don't ever trust the woman. Thanks. She took the dinghy right after my boys make the big mistake with you. Yeah, big mistake. They should have smothered her. I think maybe somebody else too. Who is gone from the island? The girl, yes. Your chief mate, no? And your scarlet queen, I saw her go through the reef. What do you think? From here, that's hard to figure. Where's your last car crew behind me? Don't worry. My boys crawl away someplace this morning. They say sunrise too red. They say wind going to blow today. You should have crawled with them, Ramirez. This is going to be a good one. See, I know this wind. I think we got out of this house quick. This is no good place for Typhoon. You got a better place in mind? Uh, you make good question, Connie. I say the wind makes us good friends when we were good enemy before. We get out of this house. <laughs> and everyone on it. Ramirez and I struggled out of the house. My cattle turned our backs to the blast and huddled together, dependent upon one another. Fighting the power of it, dodging flying branches, wincing from the sting of sand and rain that came with the wind. Left no time to think of anything but survival. Suddenly, we all became allies. Dr. Mitchell came out of his collapsing cottage, crawled to us on his hands and knees. And then behind us, half falling, Staggering out of his coma and his quivering house, came Fairfield. Ramirez! 
Both of us are lucky to be here instead of drowning on your massless hulk, Connie. I don't think much of the choice myself. Well, I do. Right now, I'm glad I trusted that woman. Shut up! What for, Professor? You think he doesn't know what kind of... Shut up! It's all right, Connie. I know what it means. But I'd like to find her. The trail leads down to the beach at the bottom of the crater. It was a steep trail. And now and then, when we'd go through a clearing in the dense growth, I began to get a picture of the place. It was a volcanic crater. And the sheer sides made a complete circle with a circumference of about a mile and a half. We were about three quarters of the way down when I caught the glimmer of water. Another hundred yards, and we broke out of the brush and hit the beach. That's when we all stopped. That's when the whole thing took on the feel of a dream. But I was awake, and there with just her bow in sight in the tiny inlet was the Scarlet Queen. I didn't have time to reach for any answers because suddenly with the ship back on the scene, we were no longer allies. Our common enemy was forgotten and Ramirez and I were face to face. But he had a knife and I had an empty holster. I think this is far enough, Curry. Yeah, for one of us it is, Ramirez. Why don't you think this way? You take the island and the woman and I don't hurt you. The beautiful traffic night, Carney. You'll be happy, I tell you. You've been in the tropics too long yourself, Ramirez. That's fever talk. No, I tried to make it easy for you. I go on your ship. I tell you, mate, you die like Mitchell in this storm. What you think? Well, you make it sound good, Ramirez. You make it sound good. Stay out of the fairfield! The only thing I knew about his knife draw was that he used his right hand, and that's what I made for. Right now. Come on. I stood up, nudged his head over with my foot, and he didn't move. I didn't know how long it had taken, but it was long enough to make some changes in the scenery. Our dinghy was pulled up on the beach. Nora was standing there. Next to her was Gallagher. I thought maybe you'd need some help, Skipper, but you did all right, didn't you? I got a few things out of my system, but I got a few more. Now, take it easy, Skipper. You're tired, so calm down. How'd you get here? Wait a minute, Skipper. Come here, you. Fred! Fred, please, Fred! She told me you sent her to the Queen last night, that you were selling her passage to Kobe. Nora! What's he saying? Never mind, Fairfield. I believed her, because she put me wise to Ramirez. He and his Laskers tried to board the Queen at dawn, but we were ready for him. She said you knew it, too, and were hiding out till it was over. You don't know how right she was. And then this morning, when I got a load of that typhoon sunrise, she told me about this place, and we came around, and a good thing, too. Yeah. That's what puts the whole thing off balance. 
The Queen would never have lived in that bay on the windward side. What's the rest of it, Skipper? I was supposed to be dead. And she was sick of Ramirez. Bill, Red, please let me say something. But you, Gallagher, you're supposed to sail off into the sunset with her. Bill, listen to me. You mean I can go into the sunset with Wait you? Wait a minute. You'll have to choose between her and me, Skipper. Well, when the chips are down, you're really more attractive, Red. Hmm. Glad to hear that, Skipper. I'm <laughs> blushing with pride. And now shall we leave the fair fields to their island? What's left of it? Yeah. And to their Ramirez. What's left of him? Yeah, Skipper. I think we've wasted enough time on Moon Injima. <laughs> A few hours before sunset, the outside circle of the typhoon had passed, and we headed out of the crater basin. I didn't bother to take soundings, but I did sketch an addition to the faulty charts of the island. Under power, we threaded through a narrow channel that the Japanese Navy had dredged from the almost landlocked basin to the open sea. We rounded a rocky point and swung the scarlet figurehead on our bow until she looked out on the course she'd been born to follow. Neither of us knew where that course would lead. When we were free of the rocks and I felt the breeze on my right cheek, I cut the motor. Stand by to make sail! The peaks of Moon Inn still held us in their lee, but the edges of the northeast trade sweeping around them were enough. Report, sheep! Make sail! The mainsail reached up the mast and took hold, and the cloying land smell was swept away and replaced by fresh sea air. For the jib sheep, men! The jibs ran up, and the mizzen, and the queen settled into a familiar position with her port rail inclining toward the green water. Is she sea kindly, Skipper? Doing fine, mate. We'll take her a little closer on when we make the north end of the island. That's an island I want to see sink behind the stern. Why you? You didn't have a tough time. Uh, you don't know, Skipper. That woman, she thinks all men are the same kind of man as her kind of woman. If you know what I mean. I think I do, and it reminds me of a friend of mine on Motomachi Street in Kobe. We'll have to look her up. Oh, no, not me. A glass of rice beer is as far as I go into Kobe. Drink, Skipper? Yeah. Hey, what's this? There's lipstick on this bottle. Sure. What do you think she was? A savage? <laughs> lipstick never hurt you, did it? Ah, uh, go on. Have a drink, Skipper. After you, mate. After you. Entry, catch Scarlet Queen, 5.30 p.m. Miles traveled, 6,215. Mainsail and mizzen reefed, ship secure for night. Signed, Philip Carney, Master. Voyage of the Scarlet Queen has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.